Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the 2021 MRC Max Brots Science Writing Award Ceremony brought to you by Medical Research Council in partnership with The Observer. Now, as someone who's spent over 30 years as a science journalist in print, radio and TV news, I'm delighted to host an award ceremony that encourages PhD students to think about how they communicate their research and that recognises outstanding writing. The judges had an enjoyable but difficult task and you'll hear from the chair of our prestigious VIP judging panel in a moment. And as someone who's judged quite a few science writing awards in the past, I will add that after reading the 10 shortlisted articles, they're all outstanding examples of clear and enjoyable science writing. And I learned a lot too about using hypnosis to induce an auditory hallucination to study psychosis, the importance of interdisciplinary col collaboration during a pandemic, the understandable sense of excitement of developing a test for a protein related to a type of dementia that mostly affects those in their 50s, and how another student's dementia research was inspired by tea with her grandmother in a nursing home. I discovered the link between the Amish and a gene that plays a role in schizophrenia and how studying the rate of activity of dopamine could help the treatment of mental disorders. Mental health issues were also discussed for children li living within the silent pandemic of deprivation, but there was plenty of humour too, from the yellow stained lab coat while studying catheter induced urinary infections, and the student who while researching a rare genetic human disease, confessed to being a fully fledged member of the zebrafish fan club to the literary unravelling of DNA to treat cancer with what must surely be the best title of all the entries in DNA Jones, Raiders, or should I say readers, that was a Freudian slip, readers of the lost Mark. Thank you everyone for 10 great reads. The winning article will be published in The Observer, a huge honour and also a reflection of the winning article's quality. As it happens, The Observer helped jumpstart my writing career too as a postgrad journalism student as I was a finalist of their Young Travel Writer of the Year Award and they published my article. And it was a massive boost at the time because competitions and awards like the Max Perups really do matter. Not only do they make you think about what and how you're writing, they also give you confidence and validation, something we all need during our careers. And hopefully the PhD students watching have already received a confidence boost in getting onto the shortlist, plus useful advice after this afternoon's science writing masterclass with Dr. Claire Ainsworth of SciConnect. Now, like me, Claire's a member of the Association of British Science Writers, or ABSW, as is Katrina Weisencraft, who was shortlisted for this award herself two years ago. And I'm delighted to say that apart from the achievement of reaching the shortlist and the winner getting a byline in The Observer, all shortlisted writers will receive a year's free membership of the ABSW. And my top tip is don't miss the ABSW January post Christmas drinks, as you'll meet many of the UK's national science writers and editors in person. And we do like a good chinwag over a drink. Many members are also scientists, by the way, so you don't need to leave a career in science in order to write and communicate. And there are lots of useful ongoing discussions about how we approach writing for a non-scientific audience. Because writing is a craft and it requires more than just an initial aptitude. As I'm sure you've learned, it takes rewriting and repeated practice to be able to condense often quite complex material into an engagement engaging article with a limited word count for a general audience. It also requires attention to detail, fact-checking research, conversational skills to get the best quotes, as well as an ability to persist in understanding something that may or may not be necessarily your subject area. And in March last year, I was one of several journalists who helped the government write an edit copy about the science of a new coronavirus for their website in understandable terms. And to be honest, it wasn't easy, not least because my degree is in physics. 
And that's something else that it's important to realize that science writing isn't always easy. It takes a lot of hard work and you shouldn't assume that everyone reading has a degree in your specialist subject. Good writing like the articles shortlisted reflect that effort because they made their science understandable and memorable. So thank you to everyone for succeeding so magnificently. And without further ado, I'll now hand over to MRC Executive Chair and Chair of the VIP Judging Panel, Professor Fiona Watt. Great, thank you very much, uh, Sue. Um, as, as you uh, will be aware, Sue is an award-winning uh, radio producer, science journalist, and former BBC TV science and environment correspondents. We're really glad to have you here tonight as our Master of Ceremonies. Um, next, I would like to introduce my fellow VIP judges on the panel. Uh, we have researcher and writer Faraha Asani, MIC Council Member and Science Director of the Science Museum Group, Roger Highfield, Journalist and Senior Lecturer in Science Communication at the University of the West of England in Bristol, Andy Ridgway, Science and Technology Editor of The Observer, Ian Tucker, and last but not least, Journalist, Author and Broadcaster, Gaia Vince. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this 24th um, MRC Max Brute Science Writing Award Ceremony. Unfortunately, this is the second year in a row that we're having to uh, have the ceremony uh, virtually rather than face to face. But we do hope to be back at a venue and seeing one another in 3D uh, for our 25th anniversary next year. Now the award is named in honor of the eminent scientist and Nobel laureate, Max Perutz. Max founded the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology in Cambridge, which is world famous and over the years has produced um, a really amazing number of Nobel laureates who have made major contributions um, in the field of medical research. Uh, Max was an accomplished and natural communicator and he once said, the presentation of a scientific discovery is, or at least should be, a work of art. Scientific papers should be written so they grip the interested reader. And I think those comments are uh, as true today as they were when he made them originally. Now, uh, the Max Brutz uh, Award aims to support the career development of our MRC funded PhD students helping them to build their careers to become tomorrow's leaders in whatever um, field they choose. It also aims to encourage and recognize outstanding written communication. The award is one of several initiatives that MRC runs to encourage and support our scientists to communicate their research. And this fulfills an important part of our mission of forging dialogue uh, involving researchers, patients and the public to help uh, shape the medical research agenda in this country. And that is uh, a, a very important objective. Now for this uh, award, we ask MRC PhD students to describe their research in 1,100 words, sharing the importance, relevance and excitement of their work with the non-scientific audience. We're really delighted to continue our partnership with The Observer. Um, for the second year in a row, as you've heard, the winning article will be published in The Observer. From this year's entry, we've shortlisted 10 outstanding writers, and this event is not only an opportunity to announce the winners, but also to celebrate the achievements of all 10 of our shortlisted students. Their articles represent the fantastic breadth of research that we fund from discovery research to clinical studies and the development of new technologies. Topics include cancer diagnosis, repurposing drugs to outsmart drug resistant bacteria, and new ways to detect and treat mental health conditions. So in judging this year, uh, we used four criteria. First one is creativity. The article should grab the interest of readers from the first word to the very last. Content, the article needs to explain the research in a way that is easily understood by a non-scientific reader. 
Thirdly, structure. The uh, article should be well structured and should convincingly answer the question, why does my research matter? And finally, timeliness. Would it make sense to readers why they're being told about this research now? Using conversational language, relatable anecdotes and personal experiences, the writers grab the reader's attention, explaining simply and clearly why their research matters. Now, Sue alluded to um, the uh, fun we had uh, um, with this year judging um, the entries. Um, and I have to say for the second year running, um, when I looked at the scores that the judges had given in advance, I thought this will we'll never reach an award winner because we scored very differently. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to say that with a lot of really robust toing and froing, um, we landed reasonably quickly on uh, the uh, top uh, essay and the run is up. So um, this experience of debating the pros and cons of different uh, essays is really in itself very interesting and it's important to hear different people's perspectives. Now, I'm proud to say that previous winners have gone on to win National Science Writing Awards, give TED Talks and present BBC documentaries. In what has been a difficult 18 months for everyone, I'd like to say a special thank you to all of our students for taking on the challenge of entering this year's award. The pandemic has emphasised the importance of researchers making their science accessible to non-scientists. And for many of our entrants, this is their first step along that journey. So I wish them every success in the future. Thank you, Fiona. We're now going to join our special guest, Professor Robin Perutz, for a short presentation. Uh, Robin is a fellow of the Royal Society, a professor of inorganic chemistry at the University of York, and as you might guess from his name, the son of the late Max Perutz. Thank you, Sue. Um, I don't know whether you can put the first slide up, Jurat. Ah, oh, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so it's wonderful to be back uh, for the 2021 Max Perutz Science Writing Prize. I thought I'd start by introducing you to Max. Um, here's the cover of one of his books, a book of essays on, on science and scientists uh, called I Wish I'd Made You Angry Earlier. I, I wasn't very fond of the picture of him on the front cover of the English edition, but there's a much better picture on the Russian edition. So you have that next to it uh, uh, with a broad smile. That's much more like him. Uh, so, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, this is another front cover, but this time it's a cover of a book called Present at the Flood. By It's a collection by Richard Dickerson of seminal papers in structural biology. And on this front cover, the cartoon shows Max clutching a model of hemoglobin, his favorite molecule, favorite protein, uh, Nobel looking down, structure of DNA, uh, Francis Crick was his first research student, it was his research student, not his first one, sorry, uh, and a structure of myoglobin at the left. So he's present at the flood as Noah there. Uh, and the, let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, I thought it was timely to tell you about the link between MRC history and fighting COVID-19. The everyday concepts we have of fighting COVID-19 go straight back to MRC. And um, I've got two slides. Here's the first on nucleic acids. And there in 1953, you have the DNA structure. Crick, Watson, Rosalind Flat Franklin, Morris Wilkins very familiar and the structure down the bottom. To the right, uh, messenger RNA. Well, we all know about that in vaccines, the whole concept of messenger RNA goes back to guess who, Crick and Sidney Brenner. And to the left, 
the not the code itself but the principle of the three letter code again crick and brenner uh, well what about sequencing sequencing dna and rna was made possible by the inventiveness of fred sanger it's his picture bottom left uh, round about the mid 70s uh, but the way he did it was pretty slow um, we wouldn't have got anywhere with that speed. The next generation DNA sequencing came in 1998 with Subramanian and Kleneman in the chemistry lab in Cambridge. They got the breakthrough prize this year uh, and we all depend on their success there. So much of this was supported by MRC and the same applies to the proteins and viruses on the next slide. So here, Max's big thing was protein structure by X-ray crystallography. He and John Kendrew were the first to do it on hemoglobin and myoglobin at the end of the 50s. Uh, but Max went on to look how mutants change protein structure and, of course, their properties with Lehman in the 70s. And then, for the first time, how drugs bind to proteins uh, in the 80s and of course no drug is even looked at these days without a structure of how it binds to its target. Uh, now below that we have the protein structure by cryo-electron microscopy. The first time came in the mid 70s but it was in 2013 that the breakthrough came so that it became a routine uh, matter to use that technique for protein structure. And of course, that's the work of Richard Henderson. And down the bottom come the viruses. Uh, the full molecular structure of viruses we owe to Michael Rossman, particularly, for instance, the Zika virus. Uh, and that's much more recent. And Michael. Uh, learned his trade uh, in the LMB in Cambridge a uh, long time earlier. By the way, on the left, you see a front cover from um, New Scientists in 1971, I think that was, Max writing about how hemoglobin works. So let's move to the next slide and look more carefully at what Max is writing. Uh, Max really what desperately wanted to convey to everybody the importance of the new discoveries and none was more important than DNA structure. So here he is in 1959, I think it's his first article in New Scientists on the molecular basis of inheritance. And he was, of course, telling you all the basic things that are very familiar nowadays, but he was pretty forthright. Could I have the next, please? Yep. So he wrote on at the start of this, it's time that we took note of these results and accepted their implications because they're as fundamental to biology today as the quantum theory was to physics 60 years ago. They should now be incorporated into our textbooks and taught to students of biology, not as atomic theory was taught to me when I was a chemistry student at the end of my course, but at the beginning. So then 1959, he was pretty frustrated because people had, weren't aware, they weren't accepting the importance of the structure of DNA. Um, nobody needs convincing these days, but that's a long time ago. Next slide, please. So uh, we move on to a pandemic, the AIDS pandemic in the 80s. And uh, in 1987, um, Fiona's uh, equivalent then asked Max to chair a group stimulating with the aim of stimulating research into drugs against HIV. Uh, so he, that he was already retired, but he took, took the job nonetheless and 
put a lot of effort into it. And no wonder he was livid in 1990 when Channel 4 publicized the theory, big program, that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. He uh, set about providing the numbers of deaths among hemophiliacs who had been transfused with contaminated blood and wrote in the letter to the press, I cannot understand the insensitivity and thoughtlessness of the people who produce this program. Have they ever seen an AIDS patient? So next slide, please. Um, what would Max say to you now about disinformation? What would he ask you to do? Uh, I think he would ask you to use every opportunity that you can to put across the science, the demonstration that vaccines work, that COVID is caused by uh, the virus and how important it is to appreciate this and to accept this. He would try and explain time and again, and I think that's what he would want you to do. So with that, could I have the next slide, please? I'd just finish with a picture of Max, uh, on the postage stamp that appeared for his centenary uh, and uh, just congratulate you all uh, and uh, keep writing. Max would surely have said that it's so important to put across science uh, in the best possible way. There isn't one way, there are many ways of doing it, uh, but keep at it. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Robin, for that insightful look into Max and his career. It's time now to meet the 10 who made the shortlist with a short video featuring the students themselves. Currently, 55 million people across the world are living with dementia. And it's these individuals and their families that motivate me and my research. And they're living with this devastating disease on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm really keen to learn more about dementia and the different types, but also one day develop treatments for this devastating disease. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder that affects one in a hundred people and can have very distressing symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions. We know schizophrenia runs in families. And since we share genes with our family members, we can infer that there are genes involved in causing this illness. My job is to investigate these genes so we can start to unravel how this illness is working within schizophrenic patients, which can hopefully lead to better treatment options. So my research area is urinary tract infections, which is quite a relatable issue for a lot of people, um, even if sort of at best you're talking a few days of discomfort, at worst, life-threatening infections, and they can just disrupt your whole life. So for me, the motivation is really there to try and do research that's going to potentially help a wide range of people and lead to better treatments um, and improve the situation for a lot of people who currently suffer in many different ways. I'm very passionate about science communication. I believe that it's a skill that all researchers should continuously develop. Um, but I also don't think of myself as someone who writes particularly well. So I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, push myself out of my comfort zone and develop that skill whilst doing something that I love. I really like the creative challenge of trying to really strip back a lot of the dense vocabulary from my project, try and find basic ideas uh, and then try and actually empathise with the public in terms of how they relate and understand these ideas and then at that point trying to build up a narrative with their understanding. I, I thought that was a really interesting challenge. 
I've always really enjoyed reading and writing and uh, with scientific writing, it's very detail oriented and there's a lot of, you know, the focus is really about the data, which is of course really important. Um, but there's also a lot more about the story behind your data and that can be a really joyful experience to explore and I really wanted some joy right now I'm writing up my thesis which is uh, you know it takes a lot of energy and effort to write scientifically and uh, entering the Max Perut science writing competition has just been joyful. <laughs> Just how difficult it can be as a researcher to switch from that more academic style of writing to one that's more suited to the general public. Um, but more importantly, that this is a skill that anyone can learn. It just takes practice. In participating in the competition, I really learned or relearned rather how to achieve simplicity without oversimplifying. Um, which is an essential scientific skill because in order to take someone step by step through what you did and why, you really need to understand every decision that you made, every method you used, and all the questions that you're asking, all the way down and in the broader context of the purpose of your research. So I've, I've learned a lot about the power of narrative, actually, so how stories can really carry a lot of weight and meaning for people. And this really translates to everyone. So across cultures across the world, you know, stories are what convey meaning to people. And uh, telling the story of your research really brings it to life. As scientists, I believe we have an obligation to keep the public informed about our work in a way that's accessible and transparent. Um, I think that's especially true now more than ever, living in the age of the internet where there's so much misinformation. Um, I think as scientists, we need to provide clarity by effective communication of our research. As scientists, we are very privileged to have the opportunities that we do to perform our research. And because of this, I believe that we have a social responsibility to make our research not only as accessible as possible to the public, to foster learning and to create more conversations about our work, but even more so for it to be communicated as accurately as possible to prevent the spread of science miscommunication in the media. I think that more than anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how important it is for the general public to have a basic understanding of scientific research and trust in the scientists that do that research. I think that the only way to create that relationship is to engage and inform the public on what we are doing and why it is important. Thank you. That was so nice to hear your motivations and thoughts. And in alphabetical order, the 10 shortlisted students for the 2021 Max Perutz Science Writing Award are Vicky Bennett, University of Bath, for Cranberry Juice Just Won't Cut It Anymore. Elisa Bran, King's College London, for Exploring Psychosis Using Hypnosis. Sophia Karotza, University of Cambridge, for Shining a Light on Childhood Adversity. Carolina Farrell, University College London, for Toward Reward how dopamine calls us to action. Ross Hanna, University of Edinburgh, for In DNA Jones, Readers of the Lost Mark. Catherine Hefner at University College London for Tea Time at Grandma's. Paige Street, University of Oxford, for Schizophrenia, the Gene Keeping It in the Family. Imogen Swift, University College London, for It's in the Blood, the Race to Treat Frontotemporal Dementia. Bindu Vicaria, University of Manchester, for Collaboration is Key, Unlocking New Clinical Knowledge. And finally, Sarah Withers, also from the University of Manchester, for Casting the Net to Understand an Invisible Virus. Congratulations to you all. Right, now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the presentation of awards and prizes, which will be done by members of the VIP judging panel. There are three prize categories, commended with a cash prize of 400 pounds, runner up with a cash prize of 750 pounds 
and winner with a cash prize of £1,500 and publication of their article in The Observer. All remaining shortlisted students will receive a cash prize of £250 each and every shortlisted student will receive a copy of the Craft of Science Writing, selections from the open notebook. The first judge to present the commended prize of £400 is researcher and writer Dr Faraha Asani. Hi everyone, I am so happy to be here with you all today. Um, I'm someone who is very passionate about accurate science communication. Um, I'm someone who's been trained in the biosciences myself. I'm a writer and an editor, so it was just amazing for me to have been asked to be part of the judging panel this year. And it was also amazing to read all of your entries, so I hope 10 of you are very proud of yourselves. So this year, we have made the decision to award two commended prizes, and the first prize goes to... Congratulations, Paige. Congratulations. I hope you feel really good about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And the second commended prize goes to... Sophia. Congratulations, Sophia. Congratulations, I'm going to give you a hand as well. I hope you feel very proud of yourself as well. So back to Sue to lead us on to the next prize category. Thank you, Faraha, and uh, congratulations to Paige and Sophia. Now here to present the runner-up prize of £750 is MRC Council Member and Science Director of the Science Museum Group, Dr Roger Highfield. Thank you, Sue. Uh, like you, I've been judging science writing competitions for decades, and it's always fun to glimpse new talent and new science too. I've learned all sorts of things from the entries this year, uh, from the processes in the brain that go awry in dementia to using hypnosis to better understand psychosis and much, much more. Now, when it comes to talent, we've got two, yes, two runner-up prizes to give this year. And so without any further ado, the first runner-up is, drum roll, envelope, music, Kipna. Do join me in giving her a big round of applause. Well done, Catherine. Fantastic. And now to the second runner-up. So cue that envelope again. Cue the music, cue the drum roll, etc. We've got Elisa Bland. Well done, Elisa. Fantastic. Congratulations. And now back to Sue. Thank you, Roger. Well and can <laughs> Thank you, Roger, and congratulations to Catherine and Elisa. And finally, the next VIP judge will announce the 2021 winner, who will have their article published in The Observer and win £1,500. It's the science and technology editor of The Observer, Ian Tucker. Thank you, Sue. Um, as always, it was fascinating to read the entries for this year's prize. It's a reminder of all the valuable and innovative work happening in institutions around the country. All the shortlisted entrants should feel proud of their entries or their pieces. Being able to write about technical and intricate um, topics for a general audience is very challenging, something that professional science writers um, still find challenging many years into their careers. And it's something that the winner excelled at. So without further ado, the winner of the 2021 Max Perus Science Writing Award goes to.
Vicky Bennett. <laughs> um, but Vicky's, her, for her piece, Cranberry Juice Won't Cut It Anymore, um, which is about her research looking at repurposing drugs to treat urinary tract infections. And the judges variously described it as relatable, a gallant way to make unglamorous research interesting, and congratulated her on a vivid description of catheter research in the lab. Congratulations, Vicky. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you to all the judges for reading it and appreciating my urine stories. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Ian, and congratulations again to Vicky and to uh, everyone who was shortlisted. Um, now the VIP judge, journalist, author and broadcaster Gaia Vince will read an excerpt from Vicky's winning article. Hello, hello. That, um, really enjoyed judging this. This was um, they were they were all really fun. That was that was the takeaway really that everybody managed to make their research sound interesting and fun. And I'm sure uh, from my own experience of working at a lab bench, it's not always interesting and fun. So congratulations there. And also brilliant that you managed to pull together stories of your research during what must have been such a difficult year where um, a lot of you probably didn't manage to get a lot of it done but you managed to hide that really well in your in your articles that was great and of course the winning entry was fantastic and um, I'm going to let you into a little secret which is that um, we all want to know uh, the makeup of the artificial we. So um, perhaps you can enlighten us um, <laughs> on that a little bit later. So I'm going to read an excerpt from this uh, fantastic award-winning article, um, which is just which is just here. Oh, brilliant. It's actually up for me to read, so uh, I don't need to search for it. So cranberry juice won't cut it anymore. I am a biomedical research, research scientist. My laboratory essentials are a white coat, bubbling liquid, and the occasional explosion. I make groundbreaking discoveries every day. Crowds gather to marvel at my experiments and their life-saving implications. This is at least my mum's impression of my PhD so far. The reality of my current situation seems somewhat different. My shiny white lab coat was at first a wonderful addition to my wardrobe, but the many tanks of infected urine on my workbench are far from glamorous. In fact, shiny white lab coat plus infected urine equals smelly yellow lab coat. And instead of crowds of admirers, the we area of our, shared, of our shared lab space is actively avoided. The consequences of any kind of explosion are not worth contemplating. Welcome to the world of urinary tract infection research. Back to Sue. Oh, I was I was hoping for a bit more then. <laughs> so, that was great. But there you go. That's that's the best sort of science writing, isn't it? It actually makes you want to read more or, or hear more of it. Thank you very much, Guy. And I hope that teaser does have you excited to read Vicky's full article, which will be published online by The Observer on the 7th of November. MRC will publish a catalogue containing all of the 10 shortlisted articles following this on the 8th of November. Now we're approaching the end of our ceremony so to give our closing remarks I'm going to hand back to Fiona. Thank you very much Sue. Um, I, I really think it's the mark of a true professional that you can uh, that Guy could read out uh, the uh, infected urine uh, uh, excerpt with a plum. <laughs> Anyway, my job at this point is simply to say some huge thanks. So thank you, Sue, for being our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you to Robin for his talk and presentation. Um, Ian Tucker, Joel Midgley and The Observer, thank you so much for uh, this partnership. Andy Extance and the Association of British Science Writers, the ABSW, thank you uh, for um, the, the um, 
as a free subscription uh, to the Society. I'd like to say a thank you to Claire Ainsworth and Cy Direct, all of the internal judges from MIC and across UK research and innovation. Huge thank you to all 10 shortlisted students and every single entrant for uh, all of your hard work, great write writing, and of course, very, very best wishes for successful completion of your PhDs. I'd like to thank Sarah Brygan, uh, Matthew Hemming, Candy Sorrell and JRS Creative for all of the wonderful designs. Debs Barber and UKRI comms team for uh, all the promotion and um, Morgan Crumbie and the MIC events and committees team uh, for making this event go so well uh, virtually. Huge thank you to Isabel Harding and Jurat Hassan for uh, running this uh, award ceremony so ably. And last but not least, my fellow VIP judges, Faraha, Roger, Andy, Ian and Gaia. So uh, back to Sue. Thank you, Fiona. And to everyone who joined us this evening, hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for celebrating the 2021 Max Perutz Science Writing Award. <laughs>